care what you watch and what you read, get the Radio Times. Natural Lies, Unnatural Causes, Bob Peck's new environmental thriller. As Pakistan and England prepare for the first test, Imran Khan reveals why fundraising has become more important than run scoring. And countdown to Barcelona, Radio Times and BBC Sport offer you the chance to carry the Olympic torch and win a free trip to the Games. The Radio Times, magazine of the year. Now on BBC One, every man. The controversial drug ecstasy is at the heart of the youth craze of rave dancing. Its effects are out-of-this-world pleasure and an intense sense of well-being. But there have been several reported cases of death following its use. Tonight's film explores the world of five young people who are determined to experiment with the drug in spite of the risks. Drugs are here, drugs have been a part of every culture throughout the world since the beginning of history, some form of getting out of your mind, be it through alcohol or eating mushrooms or eating cactuses or whatever. I think the drugs open you to more, to more experiences in reality that you might otherwise not have seen. And the drug experience is a real experience, it is another aspect of reality, it might be mind-altering. Reality is still the same physically, it's just your perception of it is being altered and so it's widening your experience of reality, if you like, rather than a substitute for reality. It's like Christmas all over again when I think about it. It's like back from when you were a kid, when you were really excited and things, that's just what it's like. Out, when you're out, no, you don't feel bad or anything, you just feel so great, you think, as I say, you can't ask for any more. In this country at the moment, these are drug is becoming like a, an alternative to alcohol, and a lot of people look at alcohol and don't like what alcohol breeds, and I don't have to explain what alcohol breeds, you all know yourselves. Um, ecstasy has become more of a, uh, a way of life for people. If I was religious, I'd say it was like a religious experience. To feel that good inside, to wrap up the best sex, the best present your mum ever bought you as a kid, to wrap it all up into one feeling and put it in a nightclub situation with 2,000 other people and you all feel the same, then it's ecstasy, it's got the right name. It's pure ecstasy.
extremely difficult to be remotely accurate about the numbers of young people who are using ecstasy in this country. If you consult any number of researchers, you'll get figures at wide variance, but um, 500,000 is, is, is a favourite figure at the moment. It could be less, it could be much, much more, but we are talking about hundreds of thousands of young people using this drug regularly. Ecstasy first made the news in 1988 when convoys of cars full of young people met at disused warehouses to party all night. The police tried to stamp out these unlicensed vents, but only succeeded in moving the scene, along with its favourite drug, into nightclubs all over Britain. Now no longer underground, the rave cult is growing fast. Last year, despite several well-publicised deaths and a government media campaign warning of its dangers, even more young people took ecstasy at club raves. Although millions of doses are now taken every year, experts still know little about the drug, and even less about the young people who take it. The adult community, if I can use that expression, isn't coping very well. Um, this drug is a category A drug, which means that young people who begin to experiment uh, can very easily find themselves charged with serious criminal offences, sometimes without even knowing it was illegal. Um, it's, it's a controlled drug. It's a Schedule One drug, which means that no serious research is, being go is, is going on into what its effects on human beings are. We have a situation where we have a highly illegal, controlled substance being used in an entirely indiscriminate way. Extraordinarily dangerous. A massive experiment in the unknown. When it comes to young people's drug use, all the interpretations start from the point of view that it must be irrational, unnatural, pathological. They start from the basic and very deeply held assumption that something is intrinsically wrong with it. But if you ask to a young person why they take ecstasy, um, they'll be a little bit perplexed because for them, quite obviously and quite clearly, they take it for the pleasure it gives them. The physical pleasure, the mental pleasure, the emotional pleasure. Flightline starts from the position of what do you say after you've said just say no? Uh, what do you say to those, those thousands of youngsters who've said yes? Are, are you simply to dismiss them? Are you to label them as being unhealthy or pathological? Are you going to criminalize them? Um, are you going to essentially to sideline them? Uh, or are you going to listen to them? Uh, to listen to what they say, to see whether there is any value in the experience. I'll go inside the club other night, I'll be buzzing round, I'll have a little dance here and there, but sadly it ain't worked, as it ain't started yet. I'll just be dancing around feeling happy, which gives, as I say, the tablet a little kick, because you're already feeling happy, and you're in the right frame of mind for going up. You get your problems inside the drinking clubs. You would see quite a few fights inside the nightclub where someone spilt a drink over someone and the other person don't like it. So they turn around and smack them. You're inside and someone doesn't like the look of you, so they kick off on you. But inside these clubs, you go out and you spill a drink over someone and they'll just laugh it off. They say, sorry lad, we know you didn't mean any harm. It's a world where you haven't actually got any worries. The only thing that matters is what's going on at the moment, and the thing that is going on at the moment is just intense happiness and having a good time. And everybody around you is, is sharing the same experience. In our world, in this world, then it's everybody together, and it's, a, it's very much a collective social thing. You see people really going for it, dancing around, loving the night. So you think, ah, oh, they're loving it there, that's great over there. And you try to egg people on, get a better atmosphere, shout and scream, and it seems to lift you. Come 
people feel very warm and loving towards other people. It's actually known as the love drug. Um, it removes emotional barriers, um, increases awareness and heightened sensitivity and increases confidence as well. It has all sorts of uh, psychoactive effects. You're aware that there's other people all over the country doing exactly the same as you, having the same experience as you, and although you're not there, you know that it is a collective thing that's going on. It's good to be part of something that feels that good. Ecstasy does what other favoured dance drugs like amphetamine and like LSD don't do. It provides for the people who take it a tremendous feeling of togetherness. It's a drug which people can go out and cease to be private individuals uh, and they can enjoy collectively a sense of being which is completely unlike anything they've experienced before. You run up and hug people just because that's what you want to do. You're, just, you're smiling at people, and you're looking in people's eyes and their eyes are smiling back at you and you're connecting on a level that you don't connect on with people who don't do ease. Because you're in the rave scene and, like, you know, someone will start a, a funky little move over in the corner to get things going on the dance floor. So somebody else over that side will start answering it. And then it's like it's like people talking with their bodies from one side of the room to the next. And an hour later, everyone's in there and everyone's strutting their stuff. And it's, it, you know, it's all happening. And everywhere you look, there's something different going on. You know, with people's movements, everything's different. The lights will change and then you'll be in the middle of a groove with, with, with a particular sound. And then they'll change it to a completely different beat, but you can still follow it, you know? And it's like, wow, what's going to happen next? Feeling great, feeling wonderful. That's the felt really tell the truth for a long while. It's like inside the club and as I say if I'd me, tablets or whatever they're called. But I'm in there and the night's kicking off, just slowly starting, music lifting up and the tunes are coming up. Like, I feel like a cushion of air just come between my feet, lifting me off the dance floor. All waves are like rushes all over my body. It's good. It indirectly causes the release of serotonin in various areas of the brain. If you take ecstasy, you will experience an inhibition of appetite um, and of aggression, uh, which is obviously why um, people who take it do feel very calm and loving. Dancing is almost like an expression of your emotion. It's a way of showing everybody how good you're feeling. It's like you're experiencing the music rather than just hearing it. It's almost as if it's filling your body because music is almost inside you, then it's coming out through your dance. It's like sort of flying. It's the music going on throughout your whole body. And for somebody who enjoys dancing anyway and expressing themselves in that way, what could be better? And you're there and it's, it's all happening for you. And if the DJ changes the sound just a little bit, you change just a little bit, you know, and he's catching you out and you're following him. And that's the whole, that's the dance epic of it all. You walk into the club, half 10, 11 o'clock, and it's sort of mellow. The beat's there, the buzz is there. And then you find your speck. I mean, I'm usually on a plinth or something, you know, because I like to get up and see whatever else is going on as well. And then the DJ takes you, and he'll have you right in the palm of his hand with the sounds that he's playing. And he'll mix them. And for me, I mean, I've always liked dancing. Years ago, I used to be like, you can't dance with Josie Studway. She's all over the place. You know, one of them. And it'd be embarrassing for people to dance with me, which is fair enough, I don't care. But now it's like, you know, he'll take you on a rhythm so your feet are going that way. 
and then he brings something else in so your hips are going that way and then the arms come in and for some reason it just all comes together. There have been a number of fatalities from uh, ingestion of very low doses of ecstasy and it is therefore a potentially dangerous drug. Um, however, if uh, you're still determined to take it, it's important to make, make sure that you drink a lot of soft drinks and replace fluids, um, don't get too hot and don't dance for too long. However, that still doesn't eliminate the risk of developing a very severe reaction. Well, as the night progresses, you'll find the, the beat of the music will become more heavy and more, say, faster and you'll find yourself more involved, drawn into the music. And I find as the beats are heavy and faster, you find yourself blocking yourself out from people around you, if you want to. And you go into the sand side thing, where you're just involved in your dancing, you feel so comfortable in your dancing, like a floatedness. Stove levels are often switched to a trance-like level and you've got all dry ice coming on and there's moments when you actually can't see anybody else in the club because all you can see is dry ice and strobe flashing and that is very trance-like because you are the only person you can see and what's going on with you is the only thing that there is and you're just lost totally within yourself. Sounds is when it's as if then people around you have suddenly disappeared but they're still there, you know they're there, you can see them but you're more involved in yourself and you're dancing. You feel very floaty, and as I say, your mind's traveling, as I say, with this feeling of ecstasy, it's just traveling. No thoughts going through all you can hear is the music, and you feel like you're part of the music as you're dancing and dancing. They talk about wonderment and uh, serenity and devotion, and they're all quite religious-like words, you know, and to feel, you know, I'm, I'm devoted to my Saturday nights to go out and let go. And plus some of the images that are conjured up that you see in clubs, you know, people reach into the, to the skies as such, reach into the lights as they're doing, looking up to the light, the lasers that are going on. Were all those hands suddenly going up? Well, the biblical epics you used to see years ago, the robe, you know, Samson and Delilah. Everyone's like this, you know, oh, the Messiah has come to us. I'm not saying that that's what they're thinking, but that's the sort of imagery that's going round in a rave scene. You know, big smiles on, on faces, you know. Whereas in, in Monday to Friday, you walk round uh, Liverpool city centre and everyone's going their own little way, you know, and, and then suddenly on a Saturday night, all these same faces like, and I saw you, you know, and you're throwing their arms around you. And those, all those kind of images, that's where I, you know, I'm not religious, but it, it's quite, you know, divine. It is a very freeing thing. Your emotions are freed from any ties of thought or restrictions barriers are broken down and so it, it is like a kind of madness but your brain is not actually scrambled you're still aware your brain is perfectly clear nothing's distorted you can still see clearly you can still hear clearly you can still think rationally and so it, it's not like a total alter ego where you're a gibbering wreck sort of madness it's it is an ecstatic madness i mean that's why it's called ecstasy because because it is an ecstatic experience and the definition of ecstasy is beside yourself and it is like being beside yourself it's like a new part of you that's just coming out in a pure way it's just pure emotion coming out and if emotion's madness then yes it is madness <laughs> can be described as a heavenly experience because it isn't on the level of your ordinary experience, it is a higher experience, but it's something that you can get without dying. You don't have to wait for death to experience ecstasy or the feeling ecstasy. So you can get it while you're alive and you may as well, because you're not <laughs> there's no guarantee you're gonna get it when you're dead, is there? After the clubs close, 
most ravers return to private parties or chill outs where they can continue to dance or just unwind as the effects of the drug wear off. The chill out brings everybody a lot closer. You're close out in the evening and hugging on the dance floor, but it's more of an emotional closer, whereas when you're sitting and chatting, you feel links between the people in your group. A lot of the time we might come back and carry on dancing because we know we're going to be awake for the next five or six hours. It's like another evening starting again once we've got home. But it is an important part of the evening and it is part of the thing for us. Your body actually feels quite exhausted. Obviously you've been dancing for four or five hours of the night and then you've come home and been awake for another six hours sitting and chatting so you do actually feel quite exhausted and your mind feels quite tired sort of you're in a daze but you still you can still function you can still go out and do things and it's always nice to go down to somewhere like the hologram shop go and do something nice if it's a nice day go out because you just feel just calm and peaceful and quite content and happy with what's going on you're not back to your normal state of mind where you can sit and write an essay or something like that, but it's a nice, it's quite nice and gentle. Visual appreciation seems to be heightened and because of all the lights and strobes and lasers in the club, the hologram type of thing is along the same sort of lines. They're not real or tangible, but they are at the same time. They're, sort of, they're the in-betweeny sort of stage and I don't know, you can't quite get your head around them. You can't quite believe in them, but they are there. The eyes follow you around as well. Yeah. Look at the size of the pupils. <laughs> <laughs> Real huge glazed eyes. Well, it's to these because that's still there, that's still happening. You'd feel like it's not real or it couldn't possibly be real because it is so good. But it is there and you are experiencing it. Friends that we've known before E and after E, there is a personality change, but for the better, you're more aware of how your actions are affecting other people because you're aware of your own emotions. You're aware that you can tell people the truth. There's a level of understanding, I think, that E people have got. They know what experience each other has had, and you've got a certain level of communication between you before, you before you've started talking to them. And so it's sort of it's a sort of deeper level and more personal. And you admit things to yourself about yourself as well. You you find out things about yourself that you maybe wouldn't have found out. Oh, that's... Oh. <laughs> now it starts going pretty. This would be quite hypnotising as well. Oh. <laughs> well, the beauty of the rave is that although one's transported to a separate level, uh, a new realm, uh, one doesn't have to answer questions. All the questions are answered in the immediacy and joy of the celebration that is the rave culture. It's, it's not, a, it's not a, an experience which one has to question. What one has to question, and question very deeply, is why it is one has to come back from it. And one of the problems with wonderful experiences is that they don't go on and on and on. They end. They stop. Uh, and from that point of view, ecstasy and the wonderment it produces is intrinsically problematic. The poisons unit actually have, have quite a few reports of people who, who take it and feel very agitated and experience anxiety and panic attacks and actually on the whole experience dysphoric reactions to it. So it doesn't always cause 
uh, this, uh, these wonderful effects. When young people are suffering from the psychological aftermath of, 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 of regular ecstasy use, uh, they, are, they involve themselves in introspection and self-analysis, which is frequently very painful and for which they're very ill-equipped. Uh, one young person phoned me up and said, I'm beginning to think about the size of the universe and religion, and I don't like it. Well, if ecstasy is taken frequently, the good effects appear to diminish and the bad effects seem to uh, increase. Um, the, people often take uh, more tablets to try and achieve the same effect, uh, but it usually results in uh, an increase in the negative side effects. I went down to a nightclub down in London and had a very scary night that night. don't know whether it was paranoia myself, but a lot of it was caused by what was really going on inside. I was feeling great before and mm. since then I've noticed I've been paranoid all the time. Mm. I can settle down with about say two or three people in a room mm. and be comfortable with them. But once there's more in the room, I'm just like paranoid, think people are out for me, out to get me. Because at the time you could probably put that bad experience down as a, a kind of one off. Yeah. You're in London, it went wrong. Is that what you did? Yes. And you carried on? But I carried on doing what I was doing. Yeah. Yeah, I carried on because I put it behind me. Yeah. Or tried to put it behind me. But I noticed after that, I was paranoid of people all the time. Yeah. Getting really scared. And yeah. soon paranoia started developing yeah. real bad. And Did no, you talk to your friends about that? Talk to my friends, but some friends didn't know. They hadn't been through it themselves, so mm. they didn't really understand. Mm. So, so that sort of makes it worse, doesn't it? Yeah. When you're trying to get across... Trying to speak to people and they don't understand. They're thinking, no, it's just your... No, they're telling you it's just your dad. When you were using lots of ecstasy regularly, did you find you lost weight? I found a lost weight when I was using lots of ecstasy, but really I didn't notice my weight loss for a while. I was out dancing, didn't really weigh myself and that. But it comes to a point where I was inside a nightclub um, one night and it just didn't work anymore because this was the first time. I um, suddenly found myself breaking down, really feeling exhausted. And, and when you're recovering from a rave, you've probably got a lot of time on your hands plenty of time to sit down and think about why it can't be like that all the time. Um, you've, you've come back from an experience which you really value to one which increasingly seems dull and boring and pointless. And that's the stage at which you begin to feel lonely and isolated and paranoid. And that's the stage where it's really very helpful if you can find something that can keep your mind and body occupied so that you aren't simply sitting it out till the next rave. I've always been a very gregarious kind of person anyway, but in myself I was quite insular. No one ever got that close to me, really. There was very few people I could trust where I could tell absolutely everything to. And then, something happens like the, the rave scene happened and suddenly I was looking at myself and I was sitting to someone who, who was a friend or not a very close associate and I was suddenly telling them all these things and sort of bearing my soul sort of you know oh when I was 15 I did this and it's sort of then I went away and I thought oh my god you know I've let somebody in but it wasn't so bad you know it wasn't it it wasn't bad at all. If anything, it was great, you know, because the next thing they're saying, you know, oh, well, you did that. <laughs> you want to hear this, you know, and you suddenly find that, yeah, that you've done these things in the past and you've been embarrassed by things. But at the end of the day, it's all part of growing up. Once you come away from the ecstasy angle of it, you realise that it comes from within yourself. I mean, people are governed in two ways, either by outside influences or inside influences. And if you can feel that good about something and then realise that it's come from you, you start thinking about, well, how, you know, what was it about my character that's brought this out? And so you start to think, you know, what is it in yourself that makes you feel, it gives you that better aspect on life, you know? That's how I deal with it. I don't know whether anybody else feels the same, but it's definitely changed me for the better in that respect. The 
when you've experienced pure emotion, if you like, you can you can appreciate what poets like Shelley or whatever are talking about, because they they've got a deeper awareness anyway of emotions such as that, and the way that they're talking about things is put in a beautiful way. And when you're reading that kind of thing, I find it a lot more affecting now and a lot more personal, maybe, than I had before, because I've had deeper emotional experiences as well now, through ease. So those who are granted a foretaste of this, and very few have the good fortune, experience something which is very like madness. One moment they are excited, the next depressed. They weep and laugh and sigh by turns. In fact, they are truly beside themselves. Then, when they come to, they say they don't know where they have been, in the body or outside it, awake or asleep. They cannot remember what they have heard or seen or said or done, except in a mist, like a dream. All they know is that they were happiest when they were out of their senses in this way, and they lament their return to reason. For all they want is to be mad forever with this kind of madness, and this is only the merest taste of the happiness to come. This is BBC One in the North. Good afternoon, the headlines. I tend to think too much worry, because I am a worrier myself. I, I think too much, think of, say, what problems I've got and what worries I've got, and I just build them, build them up, and blow them all out of proportion, really. Make them bigger than what they are, which makes me more paranoid. It cost £46 million. Pounds. I take up most of my morning straight away by going to the job club, which is um, every Tuesday to Friday, half nine till half twelve. The job club's very important because of a day I have nothing to do myself, so it keeps my mind occupied for just a few hours a week, which is better than nothing. Well, I'm trying to find um, work in scaffolding at the moment. Well, it does a lot with your mind, really, as well. You no, know, you kept busy all day doing a lot of lifting, but you've got to use your head on it. Now, with me not working and doing what I'm doing, I've got quite a lot of lack of confidence, but I'm trying to get through them by Go job club of a day, keeps me occupied, I play football, if I get a job, I find all my confidence comes back. And slowly but surely I start to lose my paranoia. Ecstasy has affected a few young people in a very different way, causing violent and in some cases fatal physical reactions to the drug. There have been at least 12 deaths reported um, since 1988. Now, ten of those have been confirmed as being due to ecstasy ingestion, and most of them were actually very low doses, uh, between one and five tablets. We only had six reported to us at the poisons unit. Um, all, all were confirmed. Now, there have also been at least six very serious near-fatal reactions. One of these cases, Julian, took a single tablet of ecstasy in June 1991. We were in bed. I heard the phone, so Bill was fast asleep. So I ran down and then to the hospital and they said, uh, we've got your son here, can you come down as soon as possible? And we went through and we heard this terrific, horrible, it was a whale and it was like an animal or a baby, a mixture of both, terrific noise. And when we went to look at him, he was stripped and there was water pouring all over him, it was pouring out of him. And his feet were coming back one way and his head was going back to me, his spine was bent. And this moan, every time he moaned, his head went back and his eyes and his mouth opened wide and this horrible noise came out. Complications basically occur from the very high temperature and include breakdown in muscle tissue uh, leading to kidney failure and uh, liver failure and also um, disturbances in clotting of the blood uh, which often results in death. And they said wherever he's taken, they don't know what was in it and they were getting in touch with the poison people, whoever they were and they just expected the worst. They said, from what we know of this, so far nobody's recovered. The essence of Julie at that time, I'd left them. I was prepared for Julie to die. Once the blood um, starts to clot abnormally, um, it's, it's, it's very touch and go, really. I mean, blood transfusions are given, but uh, it's a very extremely uh, serious um, reaction. They still couldn't get the blood to clot. 
So there's still no definite answer. He could have come back brain-wise, but his body wasn't functioning. When he did come round four or five days later, he was hallucinating, severely hallucinating. He didn't know what happened. I know, yeah. I could see, like, you know, the nurses, she was all dressed up as different people. I thought I could fly, you know, and shut my eyes. But when I first woke up, I thought I was in bed. I just heard someone laughing and I woke up, so where am I? He looked ill, really ill. The amount of weight he'd lost from the last time he'd seen him. Uh, he bruised, dead easy, really, really easy and all that. Um, dead tired, always tired, couldn't keep a sort of conversation going at all. You'd get him up and try and walk him to the end of the corridor. On the, that was at the time when we were going home. Julie would walk up to the end of the corridor with us. Get to the end of the corridor, it'd be like a 90-year-old, 90, 90 just... You wouldn't believe he was 23. Well, in Julian's case, he was very seriously ill for 33 days. He was in hospital for, for a long time. And obviously, it would take him months and months to recover fully from his acute episode. Um, there may even be complications with uh, kidney function later on in life. In spite of nearly losing his life, now that he's recovered, Julian has started going to raves again. Oh, yeah, it's the best thing. Like, it's... You like the scene, you just won't touch it. The scene's the best scene that's been around, cos lads are dancing now, aren't they? Girls are dancing, everyone's happy with you. It's no good just going out, going to the pub and going home drunk. Like, I don't like alcohol that much anyway. Nobody does, do they? We know that uh, long-term chronic use of alcohol and cigarettes can lead to death, but we don't know. Uh, there's just not enough information on the long-term effects of ecstasy in humans. Evidence from animal experiments suggests that it may possibly cause brain damage in humans. I think the younger the, you are, the younger you are, the less able your body and your mind is to cope with such an intense experience. And I think that maybe there are going to be more problems in the future because of the extent that it is spreading. I, I, Our reaction, by and large, is to lean very heavily on traditional messages. We say, just say no, when hundreds of thousands of young people have already said yes. Uh, we say, this drug is a killer. There have been a, a tiny number of, of tragic deaths associated with this drug. But by and large, it's mus much less dangerous than some of the legal drugs around. We're coping with it very badly. There's absolutely no chance of us controlling it. Um, young people, whether we like it or not, have taken a decision. Uh, and we really have to locate ourselves in respect of that decision. There's not enough advice at the moment. What the government should do is if they can't legalise it, they know the drug's going to stay there all the time. It's going to be there. What they can do is advise, advise people, if they are going to be taking this drug, not to hammer it. One of the things that young people have to realise is that responsibility for using drugs, which might have inbuilt dangers, which might cause imbalances in their brain chemistry, which might lead to overheating, they have to take the responsibility for finding out themselves. And agencies like ours have a clear responsibility to provide as widely as possible and as accessibly as possible the kinds of information which young people can take and read if and when they're going to experiment with these drugs.